Hi everybody, last week of the term here, and we're looking at chapters 15 and 17 in Mashonis, covering war, terrorism, and global inequality. Let's start off with war. Wars happen all over the world. What are the causes? Wars happen for a number of reasons, and Mashonis discusses several. In a nutshell, though, all wars can be traced back to one of these three reasons. First, money, economic inequality. We want what you have, so we'll take it by force. Uh, for example, Saddam Hussein's Iraqi troops invaded Kuwait in 1990 to get at Kuwait's oil. Another example, the Kivu conflict, a dispute between the military of the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the Democratic forces of the liberation of Rwanda over who owns the rights to mine gold and other precious minerals, which is also an example of the second cause of war, land either because of economics, resources on the land, or because of historical disputes over borders, we're supposed to live on that land, so we're going to take it back by force. For example, the Kashmir region disputed by Pakistan and India, and China to some degree. Each country believes that this area belongs to them, a dispute that goes back centuries. And then the third reason, Religion or cultural beliefs, a belief by one group that their road to enlightenment, the afterlife, harmony, or just a way of life, is best at the exclusion of others. Your beliefs are wrong, immoral, dumb, etc. Convert to our beliefs or we'll kill you. A historical example, the Crusades. A contemporary example, Islamist terrorism. Now, I'm not trying to offend, so please don't think that I'm equating the Crusades with contemporary notions of terrorism. All I am saying here is that different groups of people have gone to war for religious reasons for centuries. Whether you believe the conflict is justified is up to your own beliefs. Wars can happen for any combination of these two. For example, it's, also, it's, it's, it's always been quite a boon to declare war on someone because of their religious beliefs, and then take their land too. The centuries-old dispute over Palestinian and Israeli lands is a perfect example. How does global inequality fit into all this? Chapter 15 in Mashonis talks at length about the inequalities among nations around the world in terms of financial resources, natural resources, food, health care, protection from disease, and so on. If you want a valuable lens through which to view these situations, go back to Marx's conflict theory. This inequality is based on one group having access to the resources and another group not having access. It's just that the struggle between these two groups has grown into violent conflict and, at times, full-scale war. From a conflict perspective, you might say that in the U.S. we are lucky. We recognize that there are those who have and those who don't have resources, money, jobs, places to live, social well-being, etc. But we have systems, though certainly not perfect, for addressing those differences. Government offices, nonprofit organizations, job training centers, and even the courts. Other countries do not have such institutions available, and so the conflict between the haves and have-nots quickly boils over into violence. Why is terrorism so hard to understand? Shifting gears here. Wars and violent conflict have been around for eons. Almost since the beginning of written history, we have understood wars to be between two or more well-defined groups, tribes, cities, city-states, nation-states, empires, and contemporary nations. In short, there has always been a place to which the warring parties belonged. The concept of borders between nations is a Western concept. It is not something that even entered the consciousness of the leaders of Eastern cultures, which is why, for example, China has had such a problem historically with overstepping its bounds. It was just never in the minds of the emperors who ruled China that there is a difference between my land and your land. Tibet is an excellent example. Those who live there want to be their own separate country. The Chinese government's attitude is more like, what do you mean? You're a part of China. You've always been a part of China. You can't just say you're not anymore. So despite some of these regional differences, even Eastern cultures have come to accept the concept of borders, invisible lines that delineate my land from your land. The major problem with terrorism is that it has no border. Terrorists have no single country to which we can point and say, we're at war with them because they attacked us. 
the U.S. went to war in Afghanistan because that's where al-Qaeda had been hiding out. But just a few years earlier, al-Qaeda had been calling the Sudan their home. The idea of going to war with a group of people that is not an individual specific country is as foreign to us Westerners as the concept of borders has been to Eastern cultures. It just hasn't entered our consciousness that we could be at war with something other than a nation, which is why we've done the next best thing we could think of, go to war within a country, but not actually with that country, like Afghanistan. And that's a tough war to define. There is no country that is part of the United Nations that we can negotiate with. There is no defined president, king, prime minister, foreign minister, diplomat, or any of these other Western concepts of national leadership that we can go to for negotiations. Further, because membership in a terrorist organization does not require citizenship in a country, anybody can become a member. So the membership, their, their population, if you will, can grow without anyone really knowing who or how many people consider themselves members. Terrorism is war without any of the standard definitions that have been institutionalized in us for centuries. That's why it's so hard to fight, and that's why it's probably going to be so hard to ever win. Even if we were to take over the whole country of Afghanistan, put in our own leadership, create a new police force, and so on, al-Qaeda would just spring up in some other area with new leadership and a renewed membership. That's why many commentators have said that the idea of a war on terrorism is a myth, a war that cannot be won. Unfortunately, no one really seems to have a magic solution to end terrorism while also getting justice for those who have been killed, uh, oppressed, or wronged in some other way. So think about issues like these when you read through these last th uh, two chapters for the course, chapters 15 and 17. We've got a great final discussion, so I'll see you online, and beyond that, have a fantastic break. It's been great having you all in this course.